not created at government expense. <laughs> so I don't know if that still matters. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, we are here with a report on our uh, 15 city Be Heard on Cannabis tour from uh, this fall and winter. Uh, I'm joined with, uh, by Senator Hayden uh, on behalf of the Senate DFL and my colleagues in the House. Uh, and uh, we just want to give a report on where we've been on cannabis and what we have uh, coming forward and what we heard from Minnesotans. We started at the State Fair. Uh, we said we would do 15 stops, and we've done so. We did so uh, in a good, broad section of Minnesota, from uh, Bemidji, Hibbing, and Duluth, to Austin and Rochester, uh, around the suburbs, and in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And one of the most uh, surprising things about this tour is how united Minnesotans were in saying that our current cannabis system does not work. Uh, and that includes uh, people who are using cannabis for medical purposes in the medical program, people who could benefit from medical uh, cannabis for various conditions that they have but can't afford the medical program, people who uh, talked about uh, prison uh, records and racial disparities, people who talked about uh, the inability of our criminal justice system to keep cannabis out of the hands of young people and to uh, effectively have no regulatory structure in place that serves the public and simultaneously creates harms through the criminal justice system that are unnecessary and unproductive. Uh, the cannabis legal system that we have today is a failure, and the message is that we need to figure out how to move on from that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also, in addition to the 15 stops, had uh, teams of legislators working uh, with uh, Senate uh, uh, DFLers, House DFLers, and the Walls Administration to develop recommendations and principles for how cannabis legalization should happen in Minnesota. Uh, and in your uh, packets, you should have uh, a handout with, with those principles. Uh, those groups also then made policy recommendations for uh, taxes and regulation, uh, criminal justice, public health, and economic development. And those four cornerstones of cannabis legalization policy recommendations are then now leading to a bill that will be drafted and ready early this session. Uh, and so we will have a bill drafted to address the problems with the current system and shift us to a position where cannabis is legalized, taxed, and regulated to serve the public health of Minnesotans, to change a discriminatory criminal justice system related to the, uh, an outdated war on drugs that has failed and is discriminatory, as I said, uh, to protect public health better from some of the harms of cannabis, and to make sure that those who've been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs have an opportunity to participate in the upside of this market. Uh, so we will have a robust bill ready to go shortly. I'm happy to talk through the general structure based on your questions. But when this bill is rolled out, it will be the result of intense uh, and long-standing conversation with Minnesotans, with intense uh, work on behalf of House Democrats, Senate Democrats, and the Walls Administration. And it will be a bill that will represent the best uh, step forward for Minnesota and should be the best legalization bill in the country to date. Good. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Hayden. I am the uh, Senate Minority uh, Leader, DFL Minority Leader. Uh, I first off just want to thank uh, Majority uh, Leader Winkler and the House DFL. They have done a phenomenal job in helping us to lead uh, this process. Uh, the Senate uh, DFL uh, is grateful uh, to kind of hitch the ride and, and learn and figure out uh, what Minnesotans want. Uh, we uh, have been active in participating in the town halls and discussions inside the halls uh, to figure this out. I think Majority Leader Winkler has really, and I won't be redundant, has articulated the, the kind of pillars of the bill, um, and in particular in communities uh, of color, um, the disproportionate impact that the war on drugs have had on them. Uh, so our ability to look at this from a social justice lens uh, and a restorative lens is really important uh, for us. Uh, we are looking forward uh, to getting the bill out on the floor uh, or get, getting the bill out in, in, in the open, um, continuing to talk to our members um, and continuing to um, push uh, uh, the Republican-controlled Senate 
uh, to look at this issue in a much different way. I will say on a personal note, as I went around the state, um, the, the crowd, if you will, the people who showed up were um, often a lot different than I thought. There were a lot of people with gray hair. Uh, and there were a lot of people who uh, needed to, that believed that cannabis is helping them. Um, however, the current system wasn't working for them, um, and they clearly no, didn't want to break the law, but this was something that was helping. We've heard over and over where people, uh, in lieu of using opioids and other things that are harmful to them, uh, that they were uh, using cannabis, and uh, it was really stunning and surprising how many people that you traditionally wouldn't think uh, would be behind this bill uh, that were. So once again, uh, uh, great thanks to the uh, House DFL Majority Leader Winkler for his uh, leadership on this issue. I think he's really covered uh, uh, the, the pivotal points and the foundations of this bill. Thank you. Questions? Are you committed to bringing this uh, to the floor, the House floor, for a vote? Uh, we have not determined the path for the bill. Uh, certainly, Senator Gazelka has been pretty unequivocal on his position on this issue, and uh, it's likely, highly likely, that it will take more than one year to get it done. So our goal is to develop the bill as robustly and thoroughly and responsibly as we possibly can to start moving it through the committee process and uh, have public input here at the Capitol after we've had 15 stops around the state. And so uh, final outcome this session is still under discussion. We're not sure yet. It, depending on how you look at it, uh, it, theoretically the bill could go to up to 23 committees because it touches on so many aspects of, of public policy. So one way or the other, we will have a very thorough legislative review of any, leg uh, any legislation before it becomes law. Senator Hayden, uh, last year the judiciary considered a task force and rejected that idea. Will the Senate, do you think they'll even take it up in committee? Uh, well, um, you know, I guess that's up for the, um, for the chairman or, or the chairmen of the committee. We would hope that we would have an honest discussion this time about it. I don't think that that was honest. I think that that was contrived to simply kill the bill. Um, but what we do know, um, which uh, once again, going around Minnesota, um, we didn't ask people their political affiliations, but there seemed to be a well-rounded group of people at each and every stop. So if that is their tactic is to either not bring it up or bring it up to sabotage it, Minnesotans will be watching. Senator, how much of a campaign issue does this, does this become? Uh, well, we think that it, that, it, that it has. We think that, you know, when you start to look at some of the numbers, some of the research that is uh, out there, that uh, people want this and that there potentially could be candidates out there that are running on this platform alone, which, you know, it's got major party designations. So uh, we really do believe uh, that this is an issue. I think someone always says, what is one of the hidden issues? I don't know if this is going to be a hidden issue of the session, but we think that it is something that Minnesotans are watching. The reason I'm asking is Senator Gazelka said, and I don't know if he specifically said that there wasn't going to be a hearing, but he said that they heard this last session, and I know you addressed that just a little bit earlier in your comments, but if there's not a hearing in the Senate, this session, uh, what message does that send to Minnesotans? Well, I think it says that they don't care. Um, you know, uh, I think that um, Senator Limmer's uh, uh, committee has become a, a graveyard, a, a place where bills die. And if that's, I don't think that's democracy. I don't think that that's what Minnesotans want. I think they want to actually have a robust discussion about it. Uh, there are positions on both sides. There are lots of concerns. Even in my caucus, when we started this, uh, we did a survey monkey. We talked to folks. Uh, and as they got out into their districts and started to not only listen to uh, their constituents, but the experts that uh, Majority Leader Winkler uh, primarily has, has brought in to talk about it, we started seeing people's minds change. So we think it's a good opportunity, if we pass it or not this year, to really have a good discussion about this, bring in the experts uh, to alleviate uh, people's concerns. You know, one of the other things we haven't talked about is there often, you know, could be some folks that um, in a combination of things, could, could there's some harm that could be done to them. We want to uh, take a look at that and make sure that anything that we're doing is, is starting to mitigate that damage as well. But we can't have that discussion if they won't let us. So does enacting this require DFL majorities in both houses then? Say, say that again. Does enacting this ultimately require DFL majorities in both chambers then? 
Uh, well, I, we'll see. It, it, I mean, if you listen to Senator Gazelka, he's like, no way, no how, it's never going to happen. He's more interested in things like voter ID or, uh, than helping people um, with uh, health care conditions. So, I mean, if that's what he wants to do, then we're more than willing to have this conversation uh, and then uh, push this forward out uh, into the election cycle. Could I just jump in on this yes. point? I mean, Nationally, two-thirds of Americans support legalization. We've seen poll numbers in the 60-plus percent range in Minnesota, and the trend is continuing in that direction. Legalization is going to happen in Minnesota, uh, and the question is whether it happens this year, next year, or the year after. Uh, it, the change is coming, and we are preparing for that change by creating legislation that will address all the harms of our existing uh, prohibition of cannabis. And we've seen this on issue after issue. Uh, Senator Gazelka and Senator Limmer can fold their arms and say no, and they don't want to hear it. But the people of Minnesota will roll over them eventually on issues like this. Mm -hmm. And so they can decide to be speed bumps, or they can decide to be uh, active participants in crafting policy. Mr. Leader, if I may, along that same line. This Mr. Sen Leader? This Mr. Leader here. Mr. All right. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of leaders here. We're all, we're all leaders. <laughs> the Republican leader of the Minnesota Senate, Senator Gazelka, indicated that he would be willing to look at expanding access to medical marijuana as long as it's not a route, as he puts it, that's happened in Colorado, he says, uh, lead into uh, uh, to recreational. Um, do, do you have, will that help at all, or is that a smoke screen, or what's your sense of it? We will be pursuing, as uh, members of the House, uh, separate legislation related to the medical program to expand uh, and make it more easily available logistically and to help bring down price because it's extremely expensive. Uh, and I don't think that Senate Republicans would even be open to that conversation if we weren't pushing hard on legalization. I think they see the direction that things are going. At every single place we went in Minnesota, people with terrible medical conditions, people with conditions where their children can barely survive, we're talking about working three jobs just to pay for our medical cannabis program because it's so expensive. And that kind of, uh, that kind of personal uh, tragedy that is powerfully heard is how we got a, a program passed in 14, and I hope it can be the basis for having a more human medical program now, even if Republicans in the Senate will block legalization. Let's say that they move forward a bill that expands access to medical marijuana, and they say, we addressed this problem, we were responsible about it, we didn't go so far as legalization for recreation because we believe there's some problems in that, but we're helping those who really need it as you want to, but perhaps vis-a-vis -vis a different route. How does that play out as far as the, as far as the rhetoric on, on going into the fall election? If it's a good bill, we'll pass it and we'll make it law. Uh, there are too many Minnesotans who are being, heart, are being hurt and harmed by our current medical cannabis program, and it would be irresponsible for us to not provide some relief for them if we possibly can. It does not change, however, the fact that a lot of people in Minnesota, uh, you know, more than 650,000 people every year use cannabis because they are adults who want to make their own responsible decisions knowing the risks and potential harms. And so the push for legalization and getting rid of this criminal system that we have for prohibition of recreational use is going to change regardless of whether Republicans this year want to be on board or not. What's changed? Because uh, it wasn't that long ago you were sounding like guaranteed this will pass in the House in 2020. Now you seem to be saying, well, you know, might or might not. It, has something changed? I think the firmness of Senate opposition has become clearer, and so we don't want to get into a situation where we are pushing a bill forward uh, and getting people um, uh, focused on legislation, kind of rushing it through without having it, giving it a full uh, public hearing and vetting. So making a statement by passing it off the House floor uh, it doesn't necessarily serve the interest of getting a quality bill passed uh, when, it, when its time comes. It may or it may not, but we just don't have that knowledge yet this session. Where I was a little more bullish on the bill before Are you in the just Senate. Of the, of potential repercussions in the election. Do you want to have some of your members in perhaps less safe districts take bad votes on this? Our members in less safe districts would be better off voting for it. And why is that? Sir? Because it's a popular provision. Issues that are controversial in the state capitol are not necessarily controversial with voters, and this is one of them. So, 
I'm a little bit confused. Um, if you've got a problem with access for people with medical conditions, we have this medical marijuana program, and it maybe should be changed. And you're sounding like you're going to have a bill on that, but you're also going to have a bill, this monster bill that could hit 23 committees, that will also seek to tackle medical marijuana as well as the criminal justice side of it? Yes. So a, a medical program will exist even after legalization for uh, various reasons, uh, which I can get into. But uh, we, you know, we can we're fully capable of doing two things at one time. We need to update and modernize the medical program. If we can't get full legalization through, uh, we still need to make the medical program more available and accessible to people who need it. Uh, and that's a compassionate care kind of uh, imperative that we need to pursue. And we will continue as we create a regulated legal structure for cannabis for personal use, continue to need a medical program, and so there's no reason why we can't update that, even as we're waiting for full legalization. You're not, so you don't think that going for the full Monty here is going to hurt your efforts, or at least slow down efforts to uh, get marijuana accessibility improved for those who need it for their health? No, I don't think so, because what the full legalization conversation has uh, generated is all the uh, stories, once more, of people who are harmed by our existing medical program. And uh, people who have, you know, consistently, uh, even people with concerns about legalization will say, we do need to do something about the medical program. Law enforcement has been saying that at our town halls, even when they're concerned about legalization. The message is finally getting through to people that this is actually something that provides a benefit to a lot of people, and we are arbitrarily and unnecessarily depriving them access to it. So what, what would the uh, marketplace end up looking like if this is eventually enacted? Uh, big sellers, small sellers, uh, you talked about wanting to keep it Minnesota grown and keep big marijuana out. How do you accomplish that? So that is one thing we heard consistently at all of our Be Heard on Cannabis events, is that people want this to be a Minnesota-based craft type industry as far as possible. And so our uh, regulatory recommendations, and uh, Representative Herr was, I think, uh, active in all of those, especially on the economic development side, and others, Aisha, sorry, Representative Gomez, uh, and Representative uh, Dean have been very active in all these issue areas. Um, but the, the idea is to, we create licenses, and there are licenses for cultivation, manufacture, distribution, and retail. And we can, uh, because uh, we are creating this new industry, we can create uh, requirements for licensure that relate to a uh, number of plants being cultivated, uh, volume of sales, that kind of thing. There are various ways that we can restrict the size and we can require Minnesota-based ownership of these uh, licenses as well. We do, I, I think this is really important though, we want to make sure that we are creating uh, a space for people who have been harmed by the war on drugs to participate in the upside in the cannabis market. So having a more vertically integrated micro uh, marketplace for cannabis is part of that, creating uh, grants, loans, training, et cetera, for people to be able to participate more fully and get access to capital, which is one of the challenges with this industry, uh, is another part of it. And states have been experimenting with that around the country. It's a challenge to do successfully, but we're trying to learn lessons from other places as best we can and apply them. Home grow? Limited, Limited home grow. Limited is there a model state? I mean, it's around the nation now in certain states. Is there a state you look at and say, well, I think they're doing it right? We're taking pieces from every state. Um, and, you know, we can learn a lot of lessons from those states. Colorado made a bunch of mistakes early on that we know not to do. Uh, one thing that I, you know, we have seen is several states have had very high levels of taxation. And that has been a real uh, barrier for shifting an illegal marketplace into a legal regulated marketplace. We want this to be something that's not on the black market. We want this something that people are buying in a regulated environment. And so if taxes are too high or if regulations are too stringent and arbitrary, it'll be hard to do that. So we're not going to uh, be pushing cannabis tax revenue as a major uh, budget fix for some other area. We just want cannabis to pay for itself as we shift from this failed criminal justice model into a regulated model. In your op-ed, Representative yes. in your op-ed, you talked about uh, veterans with PTSD and not being able to access marijuana uh, through the VA benefits. But if it's legal in Minnesota, 
uh, are there still issues if they're using it with their benefits? Or what about loans? Because at the federal level, this is still going to be illegal. So what about business loans and other things like that? So uh, on the veteran side, the, one of the challenges is that the VA can't prescribe, pay for it, or make referrals. And in theory, if you had a felony on your record related to cannabis, you could lose benefits. So first of all, there would be no felony involved anymore at the state level. Uh, second of all, uh, cannabis dispensaries would be available for people to make their own decisions about whether they wanted to use cannabis as opposed to opioids. They wouldn't have to go through the medical program necessarily. It would be more widely available and the price would come down as a result of legalization. So uh, we would be creating an environment in which uh, veterans could uh, get easier access with less risk to them for cannabis. And your point about loans, um, uh, it is difficult to provide investment capital th through banking institutions for cannabis businesses. It tends to be cash intense. Um, but as far as the industry's ability to uh, you know, do payroll and make bank deposits and so forth, uh, Colorado banking has figured out that that works for them. They have to get kind of accustomed to the risk profile, but they get there. And in uh, D.C. this year, by, with an overwhelming bipartisan vote in the U.S. House, they passed the SAFE Act, which essentially removes a lot of those banking restrictions for states that have legalized cannabis. Stalled in the Senate, but the point is it's a pretty bipartisan bill, and federally they're recognizing that uh, that, that change needs to happen. Time for one more question. You talked about a question. I think you're the longest serving person up there, not counting your gap years. Um, so I kind of want you to, to think about sure. what has happened over the time you've been here. Would a press conference like this have happened with the high level of leadership 10 years ago, 15 years ago? How has this issue changed over the time you've been here? Yeah, no, I, I don't think that it would, but that's also because, um, because of the prohibition. Um, there hadn't been the research. People didn't know. We hadn't have, now we have 13 states or 13 jurisdictions. and. Uh, that have kind of tested this out. Um, California has been in this for a long time. So though we haven't had the kind of research uh, uh, that we should have um, by the federal government, but there has been a lot of states that have been incubators. Um, and I think that, you know, we're, we're learning uh, with that and we're listening to our constituents. Um, the, the other thing that I think we heard, and, and, and Majority Leader Winkler can, can correct me, that other states said that, they, that if they had to do over, they would legislate it. A lot of these were done by referendum, right? And they would just kind of prescribe to them, and then they had to play it backwards to figure out how to make this work. Uh, so we think that we have the benefit of doing really good, smart legislation on this issue, uh, getting all voices involved. Um, it has been the Democrats that have been leading, but the uh, Republicans are more than welcome uh, to weigh in on this issue. We really want this to be a bipartisan issue. Um, we think that Minnesotans have, are speaking to us loud and clear through the polls, through our through our, our own constituents that we hear. I, I happen to have gone to a, a Labor Day barbecue, if you will, from, you know, I won't name the person, but he was a high-level executive at one of our big corporations who had, so a former athlete and had all these medical issues, um, and he had to go to treatment because of opioids, um, because of what he was taking. And after that, and after he was able to detox from that, uh, medical cannabis, which he could afford, by the way, but that actually really helped him, um, and it really got him back to work and moving. And he self-identified as a moderate Republican, right? This is just one of those backyard barbecues. So it's been those kind of conversations, along with the people that we in the districts we represent, but those kind of conversations, either directly, personally, throughout the state, that I think is changing the tide. If I may, just one. Yep. When you, I believe your words were that you were saying you were going to roll out a state-of-the-art bill. Um, can you just bullet point two or three things that, that make this a state, that what you're anticipating that would make it a state-of-the-art bill? Well, I could go on for another half an hour. Uh, two, th two or three things. First of all, it will be statewide, not uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Uh, the tax and regulatory structure will be uh, set up so that we can migrate an illegal marketplace into the legal t uh, regulated marketplace. And we will have, I think, uh, the best equity proposal related to economic development that any state has brought forward. Thank you. Thanks.